Nir, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate you coming on today. I'm super excited for this and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Oh, my pleasure, Danny. Thank you so much for having me. So I'd love to start with you in ninth grade. And in ninth grade, you said you fell in love with reading in your English class. What was it specifically about that English class that made you fall in love with reading? Yeah, so I had a, uh, a, a teacher who was also the football coach. And uh, by the way, I, I hated language arts. That was like my worst subject. I'm not, an, um, I was born in Israel. So at home we spoke only Hebrew. Like I, I didn't, you know, I was, it was, English was not my, my first language. And so I, I like never my thing, right? My parents could never help me on spelling tests because English is ridiculous in terms of the spelling. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was just never a, a fun subject for me and I hated writing. And then later in life, I actually discovered I'm dyslexic. Um, and so that kind of explained why I had extra difficulty uh, reading and, and uh, never really got into books. I'm, I'm still a very, very slow reader. Of course, now I'm an author, you know, trying to explain that one. But uh, in ninth grade, I had a, um, a teacher who wasn't really into teaching <laughs> in a weird way. Uh, he was also the football coach. And uh, but he somehow got stuck like with a requirement to teach English. And uh, uh, what he did was essentially like lazy out. And, bas and basically he took um, uh, the, the, the back of Time Magazine. So Time Magazine came out every week back in the day, like this was way before the internet. Um, and like Time Magazine was kind of the most widely read um, news magazine at the time. And at the back of Time Magazine, every week was the editorial, uh, the op-ed. And so um, he would basically like tear it out, make copies for everybody in the class. And at least one day a week, that was what we did. We just talked about this, uh, this essay in the back of Time Magazine. And that kind of filled the time for him. And I loved it. Like, it was just so great, you know, talking about a subject uh, and, and debating it within the context of a classroom um, even in ninth grade, I just love the way these essays, you know, sometimes 500, 600 words would change my mind about things that I thought were, you know, definitive about the world. And I could see these things changing other kids' minds as well. And I just thought that was so incredibly powerful to, to write, you know, a few hundred words and blow someone's mind and help them see the world differently. And so that's when I really like fell in love with that medium and always really admired how persuasive that, that, uh, uh, that style of writing could be. You mentioned that you had uh, an English and and a Hebrew background growing up. How did that help you or hurt you in growing up in Orlando? Uh, I, I so how did it help me? I, it probably helped me in a circuitous way. That um, uh, so when I grew up in a suburb of Orlando, it wasn't really even Orlando, it was uh, Altamont Springs, which is uh, uh, definitely a suburb of Orlando. But uh, at the time, so we moved there in 1981. Uh, and at the time, there were very few uh, Israelis, there were very few Jews, let alone very few Israelis there. And so an Israeli family, and I have a super Israeli name, I don't feel particularly Israeli, I feel American, because I you know, grew up in America since I was three years old. Um, but it was always very recognizable, right? Like I had a very strange name and I had to explain to people and it was, um, uh, like it always, I, I always got tagged as like, okay, you're from somewhere else. Where are you from? Um, so in a way it kind of maybe always feel like an outsider, like, you know, it would have been much easier to just be another Brandon or Jimmy, or I don't know, like something else that wasn't so unique. Um, so I think it kind of gave me, I don't know, a bit of like, uh, an outsider perspective that uh, I was already different. And so maybe that allowed me to, uh, to lean into that a bit more. And so I, I kind of really, I like contrarian thinking, uh, at least for the sake of expanding one's mind, expanding one's perspective. You don't have to necessarily agree with a contrarian, but the good thing about contrarians is that they, they, they always, you know, help you see things a little bit differently. Um, of course, sometimes it gets you into trouble, right? Uh, maybe the most famous contrarian was uh, Socrates, uh, you know, through the whole Socratic method of questioning reality through this process of uh, uh, Socratic reasoning, what we call it today. But of course, they they killed Socrates. So <laughs> maybe that's not always the best example to follow. Sometimes contrarians can piss you off. So you, it sounds like you grew up with a, a name that 
wasn't familiar to a lot of people. You said you were dyslexic. So did you get bullied a lot? Those are two characteristics that people might associate with someone getting bullied. Well, I, I did actually, funny enough, uh, I'll add to that trifecta. Uh, I was also clinically obese uh, growing up. So I weighed as I weighed more than I do now as a six foot tall male uh, adult. I weighed this much when I was a preteen. And so growing up in central Florida, what we did, you know, back in the days before the internet, like everybody would come home in my little, I lived in a condominium complex and we had one pool for like all the, 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 the residents and uh, all the neighborhood kids would, you know, go swim after school. And uh, I was always that one kid that wore their shirt into the pool because I didn't want anyone to see my roles. And uh, growing up that like, that's, that's why I got made fun of, <laughs> right? Like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I definitely got got bullied and made fun of and got into fights over uh, being the fat kid. And, you know, I think that kind of shaped a lot of who I am today as well. Um, because I, I eventually overcame it. Like when I when I hit puberty and started getting interested in girls, it was a great motivation to try and get in shape because my, you know, my skinny friends were getting lots of attention from girls and I was getting none. <laughs> I was like the fat friend. And, uh, and, and so that was a good motivation to, to try and figure out like, why did food seem to control me? And it wasn't until I, I dug deeper into that around like, what was really going on? Like, why had I become obese? Like, why did I lose control? Part of it was, you know, back then, I, I just don't think people really knew, you know, like we, my, my parents let us eat, you know, crazy stuff, like, like growing up in the, in the eighties. We, we ate like cocoa puffs every morning and Twinkies when we came home from school and, you know, sun-kissed orange soda full of sugar. Like we just didn't know that that was, it was so terrible for you. Of course, like, you know, I had like 17 cavities by the time I went to high school because of all the sugar and, and I was obese. But uh, so some, that set me on a wrong path. But also I think I became fascinated in like why, why it was so hard to control what, what, what I was eating. And, and, I think that experience of like really getting down into like, what was going on? Like, why was I overeating? Was I overeating because I was hungry or was I overeating because of other things? And I think that kind of always started me on this, this lifelong fascination with how things outside of us, how products, services can uh, many times manipulate our behavior for better and for worse. Did you start to figure it out in high school or was it something that you learned much later on? No, I, I did. I did figure it out in high school. Um, I had a, an amazing teacher uh, by the name of Tracy Sullivan, uh, who taught a class on peer counseling. And uh, this was a class I took my sophomore year of high school. And the class was just this crazy elective we called peer counseling. I don't even know if they, they teach something like this anymore, but it was a life changing experience. And Tracy Sullivan, unfortunately, she's since passed, but um, uh, she remained my friend till, uh, till you know, she passed away. Uh, a few years ago, but she, this was a class where um, it, it was all about like communication. It was how to, how to, what, what today we would call nonviolent communication. Uh, and, and it was just about getting real about how to talk to people and, and how to talk to yourself, frankly, in a, in a, in a constructive way. And I, I kind of grew up in a house with a lot of shouting and a lot of fighting and uh, um, it was a very different approach. And I, and I actually like took what I learned in that class and helped my parents. My parents were going through a really rough time. And I would bring like these worksheets that we would do around how to communicate better with people, like simple rules. Like I remember there was this amazing um, lesson that she taught on staying on your side of the fence, right? Like not saying accusatory statements, not using, not bringing up the past, um, you know, staying on your side of the fence when you say, uh, when you, when you say things to people, like simple rules but that were so powerful and so foreign. Uh, and I remember bringing that home to my family and, and, and like helping us all learn from these techniques. And um, I think that class kind of helped me. It was also my first introduction to psychology. I didn't know it, but it was also you know the, 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 that first introduction. Um, and I think it was in that class that I started kind of reflecting on like, why was I doing these self-destructive behaviors? Why was I overeating? Why was I uh, doing these things that I later regret? And you know, the, the icky sticky truth that I didn't want to admit uh, that's still hard for, for people to admit today is that the, the ultimate drive of why we harm ourselves, why we get distracted, why we do things that we later regret, it's fundamentally feelings, right? Fundamentally, when, when, you, when we think about 
why we don't do something we say we're going to do, whether it's, you know, I said I'm going to go to the gym and I wouldn't, or I said I'm going to eat healthy, but I didn't, or I said I'm going to spend quality time with my family, but I didn't, or I said I'm not going to splurge, I'm going to save money this, this week, but I, I spent it anyway. We know what to do, right? Fundamentally, the problem is not that people don't know what to do. People aren't stupid. They, they know, right? We all basically know how to lose weight. We know how to save money. We know how to have better relationships. It's that we just don't do those things. Why? We don't feel like it. <laughs> like at the end of the day, we don't feel like it. We don't know how to deal with that emotional discomfort. And um, uh, I didn't recognize it back then, but th this, you know, this relates to my work today. It's the same common string that we see that, you know, we always want the, the life hacks, the tips, the tricks, the easy solutions. But fundamentally, human motivation is about this inability to deal with discomfort. So at what point did you take your private plane certification? <laughs> wow, you did some, some serious homework here. Uh, I, I did that. I started when I was 15 uh, to, to try and get my POTS license. So I actually soloed uh, before I got my, my driver's license because you're allowed to do that. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can solo in a, in a small aircraft at 15. You can't get your POTS license until you're 16. But uh, yeah, so my, my father was an Air Force pilot. And so it was always like we went to air shows and I was always uh, infatuated with airplanes. I wanted to be a pilot. Then I got glasses. So I didn't end up being a pilot at the time. You couldn't you couldn't be a pilot. Uh, uh, you couldn't go into the Air Force and let, if you had glasses. Um, so I, I dumped that dream, but I became a private pilot. And uh, uh, at the time, it was a lot cheaper. Now it's very, very expensive. Uh, after 9-11, the prices went up dramatically because of all the security checks. But at the time, it wasn't that expensive. And we lived near an airport. We lived near Sanford, Florida, had this private airport. And so I would go on weekends and uh, study up and learn how to fly an airplane. Wow, that's so fast. Like, what do you learn from flying an airplane that you still used to this day, if anything? It's, it's incredibly fun. Like that's for sure. It's one of the most fun, thrilling things you could possibly do. Um, it was a lot of hard work, like, you know, for, for, to get a POTS license, you spend a lot more time studying on the ground than you do up in the air, right? You have to pass these tests. You have to know, you know, the airplane backwards and forwards. You have to know all the regulations. There's, there's a lot to study. There's a lot of groundwork. Um, but, uh, but I just loved it. I just, I just ate it up. It was so much fun. Um, and I, I think, uh, at the time, <laughs> you know, we didn't have GPS. Like when I learned to fly, wow. I'm 43 years old. So I did this when I was 15. Uh, we didn't have GPS. There was no such thing. We had flight calculators where like, it was this piece of cardboard that you had to like turn around to like get your bearings and do these quick calculations to figure out how much fuel you had and how many miles until your next waypoint. And it's crazy stuff that like, I, don't, I can't believe we did back then, like, like slide rule type stuff. Um, but, but it worked like we, you know, it's, and, and still today it's crazy, you know, aircraft technology for private airplanes has not improved all that much, like compared to, you know, what's happened on our cell phones, you know, revolutionary change. I mean, even right now, like this is science fiction. We're talking to each other. I'm in Singapore, you're in New York. We are literally on the other sides of the planet. And we're talking through this cool video phone technology that like when I was a kid, this would be complete science fiction, but airplanes haven't changed a bit, <laughs> like especially private planes. Um, you know, this, the Cessna 172 that I learned to fly on pretty simple, you know, uh, combustion engine, little propeller and, you know, like the, the technology inside the plane has changed, but really like the guts of it have not changed that much. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was, uh, it's pretty cool that, that, that we can, we can do this, that we have this technology and that anybody can, can try it out. If, if anybody out there, you know, typically if you go to flight school, they'll give you a free starter lesson uh, and they'll take you up in a plane and, or at least show you around. It's, it's really a, a, a beautiful, uh, it's a, a beautiful technology. It's a beautiful experience. And there's a, an amazing community of people who love to fly that uh, if you're at all interested, I encourage folks to check it out. A community. Are you still involved in that community? I'm not. Uh, so it got really expensive. Flying got much more expensive over the years. Uh, so I don't do it as much. And I also moved to New York City. Now I'm in Singapore. And so to get to an airport, it used to be an airport like 15 minutes from my home where I grew up. Uh, but today it's, you know, it take hours to go get to an airport. So a private airport. So I don't, I don't do it that much anymore, unfortunately. I wish I did. Probably in a few years, maybe when I uh, have more time, maybe I'll reprioritize it. Yeah, makes sense. So you know, I was reading your bio for this interview and I, and you said something really interesting that I want 
I would love for you to expand on, which is mm-hmm. although I received most of my education earning an advanced degree from the School of Hard Knocks, I also received an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. What specifically did you mean by the School of Hard Knocks? The School of Hard Knocks is uh, the unofficial school of people who learn uh, by trial and error. And so the School of Hard Knocks is the kind of stuff you you can't learn in the classroom. Uh, so, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that you learn from starting a business and at times it not going so well and, uh, you know, struggling through uh, uh, failures as well as successes, that's the School of Hard Knocks. And I think you you there's no substitute for that, right? You can learn all kinds of theory, but until you get out in the real world and try and apply these ideas, you, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so when it comes to, to business acumen, I mean, I've, I've started three companies um, and uh, the, the, the experience, like, you know, I, I have, I went to Stanford and I taught at Stanford, uh, but I value, I think in terms of the lessons that I, I, I learned the hard way are the ones that I learned from actually doing the work, actually getting it out there in the field, talking to customers, having employees, being in charge, uh, you know, the buck stops with you when you start a company. Uh, and, and that, that taught me m- as much as, if not more than any, uh, any book learning ever could. Yeah. And I'm curious if it bothers you, the fact that you've written two books and they could look like theory to someone who's just picking them off, off the shelves, but in actuality, you've actually had business success as well. Does that bother you that you might get misrepresented by some people as just a guy spouting theories potentially? Well, that's why I tell the story of, of my background. And I think people appreciate that. I mean, each book that I, I've written two books, each has sold over a half a million copies. So I think they, uh, I'm thankful that they do resonate with people, but I will tell you a little secret that I don't write them for my readers. Uh, I write books for me. Uh, and and that's, that's not what I think most authors do. Most authors, I think, uh, or at least the perception, I don't know how most authors work, but I think the perception is people write a book when they know something. And that's not how I write books. I write books when I want to know something. And the process of writing is my school. That's how I learn stuff is I have a problem. I don't know the answer to it. I'll read every book on the topic. Nine times out of 10, I found a book that, that answers the question, I'm done. Once in a while, about every five years, I find a question that doesn't have a good answer. And so that's what happened with both my books, uh, specifically with the second book, with Indistractable. You know, I read every book on this topic. I read books about, you know, digital detoxing and, you know, get rid of your cell phone and stop using technology and it's melting your brain. And that crap doesn't work, <laughs> right? It doesn't, it doesn't work for the same reason that fad diets don't work. You know, it's the same stuff. You, 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 you can't just stop eating food, you can't just stop using technology. This stuff is, is critical for our livelihoods. You know, I don't wanna hear another professor in some ivy, ivory tower telling me to stop using the technology. I need this stuff for my job, right? And why should we? They're wonderful as long as we use them properly. And so I think that's, that's why I wanted to write Indistractable was even when I followed the advice of these books that just tell you, oh, stop using technology. Technology causes you to get distracted. I still got distracted, right? Like even when I followed their rules, and got rid of these devices, I would say, oh, look, there's a book on my bookcase I've been meaning to read, or let me clean up my desk here, or let me take out the trash. I would still get distracted. And so I wanted to go deeper to really understand what causes all kinds of distraction, not just uh, our phones. You know, distraction is nothing new. It's been around at least since the time of Plato, at least the past 2,500 years, people have been complaining about distraction. So it can't be something that's just caused from new technologies. I wanted to get to the deeper root of the problem to fix my own issues, right? Like, why was it that I would say I was going to do one thing and I wouldn't do it? Kind of like what we talked about earlier. We, we know how to eat right and exercise. We don't need to buy a diet book. We, we know that if we want to have good relationships with people, we have to be fully present. If we want to excel at our job, we have to do the work, especially the hard stuff that other people don't want to do. The question is, why don't we do it? And the answer is because we keep getting in our own way. We keep getting distracted. I certainly did. And so that's why I wanted to get to the bottom of, you know, if I could have any superpower, how do I get this power to simply follow through, to simply do whatever it is I say I'm going to do? Yeah. And you've certainly done some life-changing work and you've talked about the book so extensively in other interviews. I want to talk about potentially your next book or the thing, the question that's on your mind today. And that's something about agency 
and figuring out if we have control. Is that something that you're looking to write in the future? And if so, what have you learned in the past, I don't know, six months about agency that you previously didn't know? Yeah, too early to tell. I don't, I don't, I it's, I haven't, uh, I don't have Fair. a nice theory around this quite yet to share with you. When I figure it out, I'll write about it, but I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's still very, very early days. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I figured maybe there's something there because, you know, when you wrap your mind around a question, it, it's, we all benefit from it. And for that, I'm certainly grateful. So Thanks. yeah, I'll, I'll, you'll be the, you'll be the first to know when I figure it out, I'm still <laughs> chewing on it. <laughs> Fair enough. So, you know, you taught at Stanford university for a course in, in product design in 2012. And I'm curious what you learned about teaching that you have applied to your books and your speaking career and, and your life since teaching that class. So I, I taught uh, MBAs uh, and then later grad school students at the Hessel Platner Institute of Design uh, at Stanford. And um, I, I liked it. I can't say I loved it. <laughs> and the reason I didn't love it was because I like teaching people who have direct application, uh, a, a direct need for application of what I'm teaching them. So I like to teach uh, people at companies who are directly struggling with these questions, as opposed to, I think I got a little tired of teaching students who were, you know, asking, would this be on the test? <laughs> I don't care if it's on the test. I wanted to teach the people who, you know, with my first book with Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, I've worked with, you know, hundreds of companies in every conceivable industry from education to healthcare to finance to all kinds of products that try and change people's behavior for good to build healthy habits. And uh, that experience of helping a product team, you know, an entrepreneur go from, ah, I've, I have this great product, people aren't using it. How can I get them to use this product that would improve their lives? And then when they work through this model saying, ah, I got the answer. This is what I've been looking for. That's, that's awesome. I, I love that experience. Or, you know, with the second book with Indistractable, working with people who tell me, ah, I can't seem to get as much done. I don't know why I can't finish all, you know, the things I say I'm going to do. It, it, it's a weight on my shoulder to see this, you know, my long to-do list that somehow I, I feel like I'm treading water. I'm running real fast in the wrong direction. And to watch them work through these, these four big strategies to becoming indistractable and then come out the other end and say, this is life-changing. I, I got emailed just today from a, a woman who finally finished uh, editing her book that she's been delaying and procrastinating for two years. Uh, and she finally finished it because she implemented the tactics in the book. She got it done. And so that's just like, that's, that's heartwarming. As I mentioned, I, I wrote the book for me, but this is icing on the cake to see other people benefit from it as well. So that's, that's the kind of teaching I like to do most. Yeah, because the real test is life itself. And you are are doing that with your books, teaching people how to live life the best way possible. So take me through what are, what is the story or message that you've received? Like the woman who, who emails you about finishing her book for the first time, what's a message that you received where you're like, I cannot believe that this is incredible. Thank God that I put this into the world. Like <laughs> what, what, what do you have a story that you go to for just a heartwarming feeling? Oh, there's been there's been a bunch, uh, frankly, which has been amazing to see. I mean, I love I love these. Uh, it, this is like catnip for authors <laughs> when someone writes you and says, "Hey, you know, here I've applied your stuff." I mean, so I'll tell you for for hooked. Uh, I'm really fortunate in that I've done uh, better financially <laughs> from the investments I've made from people using the book than the book itself. So uh, I do office hours every week just to you know, make myself available to readers. If someone takes the time to read my book and they have a question, I want to make myself available. So every week I have uh, office hours. So I do 15 minutes. Anybody can sign up on my website for free. 15 minutes, ask a question, happy to help as much as I can uh, with either of my books. So uh, a few years ago, uh, a guy called me up. Uh, his name is Johan. And he says, hey, I read your book, Hooked, and I really liked it. Can I share my hook model with you? I'm going to build a hook to keep kids engaged, to get them hooked to in-classroom learning. 
It's like, oh, wow, very cool. Because I, I love looking for products that help build healthy habits and, you know, to, to make in-classroom learning less boring, to get kids hooked onto education is awesome. So I was, you know, listened with all ears. And by the time he presented the, the model, he showed me that he'd actually read the book and he'd applied it and how he was going to build this company. And at the time, it was just a, a, a napkin sketch. And uh, by the time he ended the conversation, I said, this is awesome. What, can, can I give you some money? Can I invest? I said, sure. So I put in the money, some of the first money into the company. And today the company is called Kahoot. It's publicly traded. Uh, it's worth over $4 billion. <laughs> and so uh, that, that's been, you know, not only does that feel great to be a part of a company that uh, has such a positive influence on people's lives. If, you know, anybody listening has school age kids, chances are that the, they, they know exactly what Kahoot is. Uh, and so not only is it great to change people's habits for good to help kids get you know, more engaged into in-classroom learning, but also financially, it's, it, was, it was fantastic because he let me invest and thankfully it worked out. And so I've been doing much more angel investing by uh, investing in, in people who use my methodology to build habit forming products. And so far, I've invested in three companies worth over a billion dollars. So knock on wood, that's been fantastic. And then with the second book, you know, it's, it's a very different type of, of reader. It's not just a, a product maker or an entrepreneur that reads that type of book. It's anyone who struggles with distraction. Uh, so I've gotten, you know, messages from people who say, I finally, I'm finally exercising consistently. Uh, I'm finally saving money consistently. I'm finally, you know, working on my book, uh, you know, all kinds of, of, of messages of people who uh, finally get unstuck uh, from 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 not doing what they said they were going to do, from procrastinating, and finally here they are actually doing what it is they said they're going to do. What specifically did you find in Kahoot that made you say, "Wow, this is amazing"? He followed the methodology to the T. <laughs> he he went through the book, he read every word, and he I could I could tell you know because he said, "Okay, here's the trigger, the action, the reward, investment." He actually like went through the model and said, "Here's my plan. Here's what I'm going to do. What do you think?" And look, there's a million reasons why a company might fail. Uh, there's only one reason they succeed, but there's a million reasons why they might fail. Uh, but uh, in this case, I thought it was a, a, a good enough risk to, to go ahead and invest because he followed the methodology and it made sense. It was a beautiful hook. He had all the elements in place. And so, and it did a social good, right? It built a healthy habit in users' lives. So that was definitely something I wanted to be involved with. And what does Kahoot do so differently than let's say the normal schooling system? So it's an app that teachers use to uh, to 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 engage kids in a uh, a, a kid generated quiz. So the teacher assigns kids to make quiz questions, and so the kids have ownership in the the production of the quiz. And then in class, they actually play this like. Uh, um, um, like game show almost kind of thing that that is is projected on a screen uh, you know in front of the classroom and they the the students answer each other's questions uh, in real time uh, w w on this uh, on this platform uh, and kids love it like kids are crazy about it uh, it's much more engaging than you know uh, stupid dittos that we used to have to do with paper and pencil it's much more engaging and the teacher can keep track of the kids progress because she can see who answers correctly so it's just a much much better uh, uh, form factor than the way we used to take pop quizzes. Uh, and the kids are really, really into it. And the teachers are really into it as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and on that same topic, you've, you've talked about homeschooling your daughter. And I'm curious what factors went into making that decision? Yeah, so uh, first we only have one. <laughs> so one kid is different from multiple kids. And so uh, it was an idea my wife had several years ago uh, after our daughter had finished uh, kindergarten. Uh, she had this idea of, you know, what, what would it be like to, to homeschool? And uh, we, 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 what we wanted to find a way to do was to help her keep a love of learning. Uh, to be an autodidact, right? Someone who can teach themselves. I, I think that is an incredibly important skill for the next century or for this century is to, to be able to quickly learn a topic um, as, as needed. And I think, unfortunately, our school system, uh, you know, it is a new technology as well. You know, the public school system is, is what, a hundred and something years old. It's not that old. It just seems like it's always been here because it was here before most of us were born, but it's also a technology and technologies need to adapt for the times. And so most public education tracks are designed for the last century, right? Creating good little workers that take orders and work a factory job until they die. 
Um, but that's not the world today. Most people today don't work one job for the rest of their life. They have to learn new skills as, uh, as increasing automation is likely to uh, uh, destroy some jobs and create others, people have to adapt quickly. And so we wanted to raise her uh, and, and, and educate her in a way that uh, allows her to, to flex that muscle, to be able to quickly teach herself. And so we call it homeschooling, but it's, it's really hack schooling because uh, we make these resources available to her. Most of this stuff is online today, which is amazing, right? I don't think I could, you know, we could homeschool our daughter were it not for these online technologies. Uh, but, but she really directs her own learning. And uh, it's been great. She loves it. Every year we, we take an assessment. We do a survey with her, a customer satisfaction survey where she's the customer. And she has the option to go back to public school anytime she wants. Um, but as long as she wants to do it this way, we'll, we'll continue. I'm curious, what are her curiosities going towards at this moment? How, and how old is she, if you don't mind sharing? So she's about to be 13. She'll be 13 next month. And uh, she, you know, she, it's, it's really amazing because she can scratch her interest. She can't scratch this itch of whatever is, you know, intriguing to her uh, in, in all kinds of ways. So uh, for a while, like she, she read a murder mystery and uh, she wanted to learn forensic anthropology. I don't know what the heck that is. <laughs> what is that? I don't that? know anything about forensic anthropology. Well, it turns out she went on this platform out school and uh, this former FBI agent who's retired was teaching forensic anthropology awesome. Like through the miracle of the internet, she can take a class with him. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, that's really, really cool to see. Uh, lately, she's, she's been getting into uh, programming. So she's learned Python and um, uh, now she's learning data science. Uh, Google has this new program that um, you can learn data science, uh, 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 interaction design. There's like four big subjects. And uh, they say that if you take this class, it's a pretty rigorous program, but if you finish the program, uh, and you, you do well, they will hire you sometimes for a six figure salary with no degree of any kind. Like as long as you demonstrate that you can finish this program uh, and you do well, then they say they'll hire you. They just unveil the program. So it's still brand new, but uh, she just started that. They, they say it takes six months of dedicated work, but you know, she's 13. She can take as long as she wants, but how cool would that be, right? If she like finished this program and uh, and was able to work at Google or at least do an internship there or something. I don't know when she's 16, 17, as opposed to, you know, mowing lawns or something. This is kind of, this is kind of a cool approach and she can do it from anywhere, anytime because it's all online. That's so cool. And just talks about the what we're dealing with and what we're going through at this time. I'm curious, what are some of the downsides of doing this process? With, with homeschool? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, uh, it, it, it requires, okay, first of all, you have to, um, you, you have to uh, break the mold. And I think that's the hardest part. You have to be okay with, as a parent, being all right with things not being for your kid the way they were for you. I think our default state as parents as well, that's what I experienced. So, you know, they should too, whether it was good or bad, right? Like we tend to inflict, you know, I got through it. So you have to suffer too. Well, why? <laughs> like, why can't we do it better? Why do we have to keep punishing people with a, a silly way of doing things if we can make it better? So I think, but I think that's really hard. Like for, I resisted, actually, this was my wife's idea originally, but I really resisted to like, yeah, but she's going to miss out on this and she's going to miss out on that. Like one of the worst things, by the way, is, uh, is, is dealing with like people's prejudices, right? So she's homeschooled. So everybody's first question, and it wasn't yours, thankfully, but people's first question is what about socialization? How is she gonna get to interact with kids? Well, she's done with school by noon, right? So she, she homeschools from 8 a.m. to noon. From noon to one, we have lunch together as a family, which is amazing. I get to spend more time with her. And then from one o'clock till dinner time, she can do whatever she wants. So she goes and plays with other kids for the rest of the day. She's just a kid. She can play, <laughs> right? And so she's crazy socialized. Like she's, she's, uh, she's uh, you know, like she could get along with anybody uh, because she has so much time to play as opposed to, you know, it, uh, I don't know about you, but when I was her age, 
you know, I wasn't like I had a perfect social experience in middle school either. I, I got, I got beat up. I got, <laughs> I had all, there were cliques, there were, you know, gangs, there were, there was a lot of crappy social experiences in middle school. It's not like it's perfect either. Uh, but I, I don't know. She, she seems to love it. And uh, she, socialization is not a problem at all. But I think what's harder about it is it requires more planning. Like you do have to, someone has to be the principal. Someone has to kind of plan the guardrails for her education. Now you, you do that less and less. Like when she was very young, when she was in first and second grade, you really have to do that a lot. But as she, uh, you know, as kids get older, you give them more and more freedom to choose their own path. And I would expect by the time she, you know, a few more years in high school, she'll do it all by herself. You know, it's interesting. I, we have this, this track of people doing each grade by year, but what if a student is, is faster than a first grade level and is learning a first grade level in six months versus, or what if they're learning it in a year and a half? Like, totally. shouldn't we be paying attention to that? Right. Who cares? Or, or wants to go deeper, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, I remember when she was in uh, kindergarten, she was obsessed with Egypt. Uh, and they studied it in her kindergarten class for like a day and she wanted more, but nope, we got to move. Come on, come on. <laughs> we got to stick with the curriculum. So the flexibility to go deep on things that you want to go deep on and not explore things that you're not really interested in, uh, I, I, I think is, is super important, right? Like to follow that curiosity, to follow that spark is, is wonderful. I think there's also the added benefit of, you know, we lose sight of who is the customer, right? Who is the customer when it comes to school? It's the kid right? It's not the teacher. It's not the teacher's union. It's not our job to make teachers and their unions happy. It's our kids we have to make happy. We have to make sure that they are prepared for, for their future, that they are motivated. Uh, so, you know, I love the fact that my kid can fire her teacher anytime. And it happens all the time. She she has a, a, a an instructor online. And if that t- teacher rubs her the wrong way and she doesn't really like the teacher, it's, you know, just a bad vibe. Next right? Move on, find a different teacher. And I remember when I was in school, you get assigned a teacher, you know, my fit, my physics teacher in high school, I would have loved physics, but I had the worst physics teacher that was just waiting to cash in his pension. He was just dialing in. He, he was terrible. And I hated the subject because this schmuck ruined it for me. Well, that's not going to happen with my daughter because if she doesn't like the instructor, hey, we'll move on to the next one and find you know someone who, who you do vibe with. Yeah, you you brought up two great teachers you had, and what if every single class was like that teacher? You'd be living totally. in a completely different world. Totally, and and thankfully, you know, it's funny. Many of her teachers that she works with online are actually public school teachers that do this on nights and weekends, hmm. uh, and so they're they're making extra money by you know uh, tutoring kids on this online platform. There's many online platforms that they do this on, and many of them are awesome. They are wonderful, wonderful teachers. They really love it. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's just about finding those, those highly rated teachers that, that the kids really like. Yeah, that's amazing. So I want to get back to you and I want to ask about your closet and the hundred dollar bill. What, (laughs) what is that all about? Sure. So we didn't, we haven't actually talked about the methodology in indistractable. So I'll, I'll bounce ahead a little bit. So there's four big strategies to becoming indistractable. The fourth of which, the final technique, which I have to give you a word of warning, you cannot do unless you do the first three. Okay, so if you do what I'm about to tell you to do, or what I'm about to tell you I did, it's up to you whether you do it or not. If you don't do the other three steps first, this will not work. In fact, it will backfire, okay? It will harm you if you do this. So I'm warning you, you have to do the three steps that come before this fourth step first. So the fourth step to becoming indistractable is preventing distraction with pacts. A pact is a pre-commitment. It's when we have some kind of firewall that prevents us from getting distracted as the last line of defense, as the the, the, the firewall against distraction. So one of the pacts, one of the pre-commitments we can use is called a price pact. A price pact is when there's some kind of monetary disincentive to doing something we don't want to do, right? So we decide in advance that there's some kind of disincentive to getting distracted, a financial disincentive. So in my case, as I mentioned, I used to be clinically obese. I've never liked exercise. I still to this day uh, have no idea what people are talking about when they say they get a runner's high or they feel amazing after the gym. I just feel dirty and sweaty. I, I, I still don't really love exercise to be honest, even though I'm in better shape at 43 than I've ever been in my life. Uh, I'm not saying this to brag, but 
Uh, I have a, I have six pack abs for the first time in my life. And not because I'm super athletic. I'm not, I have no coordination, but I simply exercise consistently, right? One of the mantras that you, that people learn in the book is consistency over intensity, consistency over intensity in all things. And any goal that we want to endeavor towards, it's about consistent forward progress, not, you know, I'm going to be a weekend hero, or I'm going to make a new year's resolution and work out for a month. No, with everything in life, whether it's your relationships, your business, your uh, your health and wellness, consistency over intensity. So how did I gain consistency? I made a, a price pact with myself. How, what does this look like? So after I did the first three steps, okay, I'm saying that again as a warning, after I did the first three steps, the fourth step that I implemented was to make a price pact with myself. What does this look like? Every morning when I get dressed, in my closet, there is a calendar taped to the wall and on today's date, there is a crisp $100 bill taped to the day's date, okay? Uh, so, to, uh, so today's the 13th of July. 13th of July, there's a $100 bill taped to today's date. Now, above the calendar, on the shelf above it, there is a Bic lighter, okay? And that Bic lighter is there in case I don't exercise that day, and it's According to me, I'm not saying you need to do this, right? This is what I, a promise I made to myself to do some kind of physical activity every day, whether that's, you know, do a few push ups, walk around the block, uh, go to the gym, do some kind of physical activity every day. If I don't do it, that brick lighter is there to light the $100 on fire on the spot. Okay. So this is called the burn or burn technique, meaning I can either burn the $100 or I can burn some calories. Okay. And that technique, and now could I cheat? Of course I could, right? I could cheat, but my integrity is worth more than that, right? My integrity, my personal integrity to say, to look at myself in the mirror and say, I made a, pro a promise to myself that I kept is worth $100 for me. Now, here's the secret. I've been using this technique for, what is it now? Four years, okay? And I'm in the best shape of my life at 43 years old. I've never been this physically fit. Because I now work out consistently. That's what I said I would do. And darn it, I do it. It's just that simple. I don't kill myself every time I exercise. It doesn't take that. It just requires consistent action, right? Not getting distracted, not procrastinating, but do it. And that reminder, to be honest, I don't even need it anymore. I don't need this, this uh, burn or burn technique anymore because now it's become something I wouldn't dream of not doing. It's become part of my life. It's who I am. I am indistractable. But to get me going, that threat, that pre-commitment, that price pack that I made was, was incredibly effective at providing that firewall against distraction that I knew if I didn't do that thing I said I was going to do, there was going to be a financial penalty. And now this isn't just a technique I made up. I've adapted it, but this actually, uh, came, so everything in my book, Indistractable, is based on peer-reviewed studies. There's over 30 pages of citations uh, to peer-reviewed studies. I hate these self-help books where people just make stuff up. <laughs> I hate that. I wanted, you know, I wanted to be able to point to people to the research where this stuff came from. And so this is a technique I learned from the most effective smoking cessation study in history. The most effective smoking cessation study in history compared uh, a, a control group where they said, I just want to quit. Okay, go for it. Then there was a, a one condition where they gave people access to nicotine patches and nicotine gum and anything they wanted, all the traditional techniques, whatever they wanted, free access to any of that stuff. And then the third group was a group that made a bet that said, to be in this program, you have to give us $150. And if you don't smoke for six months, as verified by your analysis test, if you don't smoke for six months, you get the $150 back plus a $600 bonus. And that group was by far the most effective. By the way, they also gave a six, uh, the, uh, sorry, $450 bonus. They gave $450 bonus plus the $150 you put down. So total of $600. They gave $600 cash to the other two groups, right? So group one, quit, we'll give you $600. Group two, we'll give you $600. Plus you can use nicotine patches and nicotine gum and all this traditional stuff to stop smoking. Group three, Give us $150, you get it back, plus $450 bonus. So less money <laughs> that you got as a bonus, $450 as opposed to $600. But that group that made the bet with themselves was by far, it was 17 times more effective than the other two conditions. And so that's where I learned this technique and adapted it for, for my goal. I don't smoke, I've never smoked, but 
this was something a goal I wanted to to do. I wanted to, I didn't want to quit smoking. I wanted to quit squelching on my workouts and skipping my workouts. And so that's how I use this technique and it's incredibly effective. It's also how I finished my book, by the way. I took a, a bet with my friend, Mark. I made, this was a lot more expensive. Uh, I made a bet with him for $10,000. I had been writing my book for four years, uh, doing the research. And frankly, I was, I was procrastinating. I was distracted and I knew I was doing this. But when I came across this technique, I said, okay, now I need, to, I need to put this into practice. How do I do this? And so I made a bet with Mark that if I didn't finish my manuscript by January 1st, I was going to pay him $10,000. Now, you think I paid him the $10,000? Of course not. I finished my book and I, got my 10, I kept my $10,000. So again, it's a very effective technique, but one more time, I want to warn you, it does not work if you don't set yourself up for success with the other three tactics first. Okay, so what are the other three tactics? So the other three tactics, number one is to master the internal triggers. We, we touched on this a little bit at the very beginning, mastering these internal triggers. These, this is the vast majority of the time that we get distracted. It's because of a feeling, right? It's about boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty. The reason we don't exercise, eat right, do the work we say we're going to do, procrastinate, all these things that we don't do when we say we will, it's again, because we don't feel like it. So we have to first and foremost, master the internal triggers. One of the big takeaways in the book is that time management is pain management. Time management is pain management. If you don't learn how to master discomfort, it will become your master. So the reason that people drink too much or watch too much TV or scroll social media too much or whatever is always because of a desire to escape discomfort. So you have got to learn how to master those internal triggers. That's step one. Step two is make time for traction. That the vast majority of people out there, uh, they, they don't keep a calendar. They don't keep any kind of schedule and they, they, they complain about how distracted they are. Well, the fact of the matter is you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. How can you call something a distraction? You have no right to call it a distraction if you can't point to what you got distracted from. So you have to put the, the turn your values into time and know how you intend to spend your time in advance, not with a to-do list. To-do lists, by the way, are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. Rather, we measure ourselves by our ability to do whatever it is we say we're going to do without distraction, whether we finish the task or not much more important to learn to work with that distraction. That's how we finish these tasks. Keeping a to-do list and measuring your self-worth by how many cute little boxes you checked off, mm -mm, it does not work. It's been proven to be much more effective to use what we call a time box schedule, plan the time, the input, not the output. The output will follow if you follow the methodology. And then the third step is to hack back the external triggers. This is where we deal with all the pings, dings, and rings, not only from our phones and our computers, but in our workplace environment, the number one source of distraction with the modern knowledge worker is other people, whether it's working in the office and your boss, you know, taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, I need that report right now. That's distracting. What do you do about that? What do you do when you work from home? And now your kids are the distraction, right? So distraction can come from all kinds of different forms. So one of the uh, crucial steps is to hack back all those external triggers. So I show you one by one by one how to hack back all those external triggers. And then the fourth and final step as the last line of defense is to prevent distraction with packs. We have price packs that we talked about a bit. There are also effort packs and what we call identity packs. So it's really about using these, all these techniques in concert. It's not, there's no one magic bullet, right? It's, there's no you know, life hacks and you know, give me the one magic secret. No, no, no. It's about doing one thing, at least one thing from each of these four big strategies, mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back external triggers and preventing distraction with packs. When we use these four techniques in concert, this is how we become indistractable. I've heard you go through that so many times and you present it so well. How do you prepare to present it? Well, five years of research and writing definitely helps. <laughs> um, I think it's about you know knowing the material and most importantly, knowing it works right? That, that I use it in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, being indistractable doesn't mean you never get distracted. I still get distracted from time to time. And I made up this word so I can define it any way I want. Uh, it doesn't mean you never get distracted. It's about knowing why you got distracted and you do something about it. So there's this wonderful quote by Poelo Coelho who said, a mistake, uh, sorry, a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. 
A mistake repeated more than once is a decision. How many of us keep getting distracted by the same freaking thing day after day after day? How many times can we complain about you know, Facebook and our iPhone and this distracted me, that distracted me. Okay, do something about it for God's sakes. How many times can you get distracted by the same thing? So if you get distracted once, okay, happens, right? I still get distracted when something changes, unexpected, hey, came out of nowhere, fine. Once, once, I'm not gonna let it happen to me again. Why? Because I take out the indistractable model and I ask myself, okay, why did I get distracted? And what can I do today using these four strategies to prevent getting distracted again in the future? I love it, man. I love it. And this is a model that my brothers used. I, I assume that it's uh, an incredible one and I'm, uh, I'm really grateful for having you today. You know, you, you talked about your definition of greatness before we wrap it up. You said, your definition of greatness is living out your values. How can we better live out our values with the indistractable model? Well, I think it starts with defining what your values are. So, and, and that starts with understanding what does the word even mean? What are values? I define values as the attributes of the person you want to become. Attributes of the person you want to become. So to do that, uh, how do we tell what are attributes of the person you want to become? You know, the best way to understand someone's values, the attributes of the person they want to become, is to see how they spend their time and their money. That'll tell you everything you need to know about their values. You know, not what they say, not what they say, but what they actually do. How do they actually spend their time and money? That will tell you their values. The beauty of 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 uh, you know time versus money. You know, when it comes to money. Uh, we use and, mo and money and time, we use the same language, right? We spend time just like we spend money. We make time just like we make money. We pay attention just like we pay with dollars and cents. But money, you can always make more of, right? You can have an infinite amount of, uh, a virtually infinite amount of money, right? It, but here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. They all have the same amount of time as you have. They might have more money, but they don't have any more time. They all get the same 24 hours in a day that everyone else gets. And so I find that people are way too stingy with their time. I'm sorry, way too stingy with their money, I should say. You know, we, we bargain over a penny here and there. We clip coupons. If, if an app wants to charge us 99 cents, we, oh, that's too expensive, right? We're super cheap with our money. And we're, you know, we, we, we spend our time, we just give it away to whoever wants it. And it should be exactly the opposite. We should be generous with our money because we can always make more. We should be stingy with our time because we cannot make more of it. We only get 24 hours in every single day. So, so it's really about understanding the importance of, of living out your values by defining them in advance and turning those values into time. How do we do that? We put our values on our schedule. So part of the indistractable methodology is to ask yourself, for these three life domains that I talk about in the book, starting with you, how much time would the person you want to become spend on themselves, right? Whether that's time to read, time to meditate, time to pray, heck, time to play video games. I don't care. It's up to you according to your values. It's not up to me or anyone else to tell you what your value should be. What I want you to do is to turn those values into time. If you want to spend hours of your day playing video games, do it but put it on your schedule. So you're doing it according to your values, not someone else's. Then your relationships. Do you have time in your day for the important people in your life? Is that time scheduled and protected? Don't just give them the scraps of time that are left over. Book that time with the important people in your life. Then finally, your work, right? Do you have time in your schedule to do the things that are required to move you forward in your work? Is it all just reactive work, reacting to emails, reacting to notifications, reacting to meetings? Or do you have time in your schedule booked and reserved for reflective work, time to think, to strategize, to plan? That time has to be booked in advance. If you don't do it, you're going to be reacting all day. And this is what most people do. Most people do not like to think. They like to be told what to do all day. So they allow themselves to be distracted by every little ping and ding because they're too lazy to sit down and ask themselves, wait a minute, what do I actually want to do with my time? And I think that's a big mistake. You see a lot of people running real fast in the wrong direction because they haven't stopped to ask them, what are my values and how do I turn my values into time? I hope that inspires somebody out there to... One, value their time more. And two, to check out Nears Books. 
Hooked, how to build habit-forming products and indistractable, how to control your attention and choose your life. You can find more from Nir at Nir, I-L-N-I-R-E-Y-A-L, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, on Twitter and N-E-Y-A-L-99 on Instagram, N-E-Y-A-L-99 on Instagram. He's also on LinkedIn and Medium. Where should people contact you if they want to tell you how great you did on this interview? Oh, I appreciate that. Well, the best place to, to check my workout is on my blog, nearandfar.com, but near is like my first name, so that's N-I-R and far.com. There's actually an 80 page workbook that we couldn't fit into the final edition of the book. It got too big. So it's there available for free. Anyone can download it. Uh, that's all at nearandfar.com. Well, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate you, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Danny.